Hello, this is Professor Imler, and this video is primarily about giving us a shared language to discuss these political ideologies. So I'm going to talk through kind of each of them and just know this is a reduction of an incredibly, right, maybe it's over, it's over there for you, um, but incredibly varied, right, um, nuanced, complex, changing, right, so what certain things meant in discourse now meant something different in different places in different times. Um, so because of that, we want to have a shared language that we can use to discuss these things. And in this class, we really want to have productive, fruitful discussion, which in order to do that, we have to have, in order to get at good analysis and reflective, critical engagement discussion, those things, we have to know what we're talking about and we have to have some kind of a shared basis. So let's go through these things for the purposes of this class, at least. Whenever I say any of these terms, this is essentially what we're meaning. And it should be the same for you once you read, once you watch this. Okay, so liberalism, all about natural rights need to be protected, but then, and that's mainly the function of government is to protect those natural rights for these people. Um, but then also, what organizes material society isn't any kind of like directed thing by any kind of public body. Instead, it's the market and individuals and groups making decisions in a free and open market it goes right with social contract theory. Um, let's see, and, and the government ultimately enforces those contracts. Um, but yeah, the market materially organizes society, not any kind of central planning. Um, then we go down to conservatism, and that's interesting to talk about because um, in terms of political philosophy, conservatism doesn't have to have any set belief. Um, and this is not bad, so don't, don't take that as a, as a bad thing. Um, but instead, how do I want to phrase this? Well, I mean, look, look at what I have here. Um, over in this area, let me see if I can get a little draw. Little blue pencil, maybe. Right. This is really what matters. Is and I, and I say idealized. Um, the past that we think worked. That's that's the thing. It isn't just the past for the past's sake. Maybe that's what some of us end up doing. But that's altogether different from what's the goal. And the goal here is to say, hey, when change happens in a society, if it happens too quickly. Um, or if we don't think things through, it could be disastrous. And they'll point to different periods in time when a society tried to make a great leap forward or something, and it didn't quite work out the way that people intended. And so even though we might want to make good change, we need to do it slowly and deliberately and in a assured manner. And so conservatism is about the present and maintaining the goodness of the past in the present. What that means is it doesn't have to necessarily have any particular content in order for it to be conservative. Now, in this country, that's not true because there's a popular discourse about conservatism, which fills that up with what conservatives think right now um, is the stuff that we should be preserving. Um, but that'll be different in a few years, and that was different in the past. And that's not a bad thing at least in terms of political philosophy language. It's just the notion of the main thing we need to do is take things slow and to do things well. Um, so that may or may not be what you have heard about conservatism, but that's how we're going to discuss it. And notice, you know, with the liberalism, that could describe a lot of the both political parties in the United States for a very, very long time. That is because we are a liberal democracy. Um, we hold to these liberal values and it's embedded in a lot of our social structures. Um, and you notice that's very different than someone who might call themselves a liberal today, which usually means they're like around the Democratic Party. Uh, just like conservative today means around the GOP, um, the Republican Party. So, you know, in our discussion, it's like, in our popular discourse, this is the great left party or position, and this is the great right party. 
And in terms of political philosophy, that's just not really the case. But in our contemporary discourse, it is. So that nuance is hard to always communicate in a class like this, but it's also really important for us to have a good discussion to have these categories understood. Okay, so let's, okay, let, we've gone down a little bit. Now let's go up to democratic socialism. And this is really, this is really contested. I mean, essentially it's people who don't want to leave the free market completely, um, but also say, uh, says that, hey, get, like in order to keep our natural rights, often that's how it's framed, uh, we need to help maintain the public good. And that takes some organization, that takes public resources, that takes taxes, right? We want to reform capitalism and our democracy into a better future. So this is about forward change. You could say this is progressivism or something. That's going to be a really bad. Wrong. Okay. You could say that. I mean, it's this. And, and then because this is, uh, there's a left of liberal, uh, that's one of the more recent developments. Uh, there's a lot of contested discourse about what to call stuff that's just slightly left of liberal but not willing to make the drastic changes that uh, the really the actual leftist groups. I don't know why this pencil's not changing. There we go. Actual left groups take uh, because these three um, really are really out of the real center, even though in our small in our in a smaller way, here is the big left right distinction. So again, language is slippery here, but we can still sort it out. We're a very capable people. Okay, so that's democratic socialism um, tries to find some balance between between these. All right, um, I'm going to move back to the right and I'm going to move away from uh, liberal conservatism and move into something else. And again, uh, what you want to name things exactly here, I understand this might be contested, but again, this is how we're going to describe this. So sometimes you'll have people who say, well, I'm a nationalist or I, you know, I believe in nationalism. And what they're really talking about is sometimes they they want to be patriotic. They, they love the country. They think it's good. They want to hopefully improve it. Um, those types of things. That's not what I mean by nationalism. Um, instead, uh, nationalism is this type of um, insulation of a group where you say, you know, my, I'm in Missouri, let's just use Missouri, let's pretend it's a nation. Like the people of Missouri are my people and everyone else is an enemy by virtue of them being on the other border. And ought to maintain that moral idea of, of hierarchical or, or it's about me and against you, you have to invent stories that make sense of that. So you get these racist narratives and by racist, I do mean um, philosophically creating a system of thought and narrative and action that demeans or demotes one group of people, um, dehumanizes them. That's what I mean. Um, and then the state is kind of fetishized. And what I mean by that is um, it becomes this external object of identification and uh, we become obsessed with, with it and with its um, power and prestige. We, uh, we almost worship it like a god. Um, that's what we kind of mean here. It becomes the lotus of our, locus of our value and being. Um, it's also reactionary. So if you would imagine, look at the, the left and the center, um, they have a particular ideal in mind. Right, so think about natural rights, think about free markets, think about, hey, we need a public good um, that's robust. When you look at those notions, um, sorry, this tickled me. Yeah, so when you look at those notions, they have an ideal, right? Conservatism, especially liberal conservatism, um, democratic socialism, liberalism, and even socialism, communism, and anarchism, they do have this uh, philosophical ideal, whether we like that ideal or not, but they do have an ideal that they're trying to achieve. Uh, so in that sense, they're not reactionary. They're, you can say they're progressive, but they're idealistic, certainly. And that's what they're chasing after. 
Uh, when I say reactionary, there's no progress, there's no innovation made. It's only a series really of defensive moves to say, well, you know, I cannot think of you, I, I don't like this, I cannot believe in, in this argument. Um, or, oh, these people are using this, this term that I find threatening to my narrative of a racist uh, state that I, I'm wanting to kind of breed. Um, I need to counter or react or defend against that. Uh, so they're not very good at taking criticism to improve. And that makes sense given kind of what they see, but what they're building are these, what we call these hierarchies of separation. So us and them and exclusion. You're not really a person or because you do not come from this country, you don't get the rights and you don't deserve the rights. Right? You, you notice that language there. Um, it's exclusion and hierarchy. Uh, so now that's, that's nationalism. And let's extend and intensify that logic further. So moving beyond racist narratives that are more just those bad people over there, um, which, you know, is not ideal in the slightest, um, but fascism moves further. Uh, it's still reactionary, so it's primarily defensive and there's no internal flourishing that's attempted um, other than maybe intensification of power by the people who are already in charge. Um, but not only the state is reactionary, it's also the guardian of this mythical purity. Um, and so that can be a lots of different things. Uh, and the fascism looks different in each instance. Italian fascism was very different from British fascism, which is very different from German fascism, right? You can go on and on and on. So it doesn't always have to be just Nazis and stuff. Um, and there's an extended discussion on what that is, but at its core, it's a popular uh, movement who's obsessed with the mythical purity of the people, the bulk, the state. Um, and they partner with, and, and they're really upset and frustrated because things aren't working for them. And so they produce this kind of, I'm, I'm here, I'm thinking of Paxson's definition, which I wish I had in front of me real quick. Um, but essentially it's the powerful in society kind of realizing, oh, these people are upset and they might do some hurting. They end up allying with them. And maybe in this class, we'll look at a longer discussion of this, but essentially, this is what they form and so they're guarding this mythical purity and what that means is not only is it those people are bad or, or maybe we just you know mistreat these people it's no we have to clean and cleanse and eradicate our society of the other and so you have that mythical purity in the state genociding and, and here i mean the wide uh, definition uh, becomes genocidal in one way or another you have to be, there are purges, all kinds of stuff. Now, fascism is not totalitarianism or authoritarianism, um, even though it's very authoritative. Um, but there are other different totalitarian systems. So anyway, we're, now let's move to the left. So we have socialism. Again, hotly contested term, usually used really poorly in our national discourse. And I mean this from the left and the right. Um, but at its core, socialism is a critique of capitalism. It says, hey, capitalism is failing to deliver on its promises of, well, let me think about the French Revolution. Um, Egalita, like, I'm, I'm, I'm almost saying the French, but um, equality, fraternity, and liberty. We should be able to, and if you think about feudal um, monarchy in France at the time, it makes a lot of sense. but. Right? We want to be able to assemble with who we want and engage and talk with whoever we want. We want to be equal in society. Just because you're rich doesn't mean you're better or should be afforded more rights than me. Um, and liberty, we should have well, freedom. I mean, you know, and, and they say the socialist critique and, and socialism, you know, was before Marx. There's a thousand different types and they all are pissed off at each other if you listen to them. Um, that's kind of what the left says about the rise of Nazism in, and um, fascism in Italy and Germany in the World War II is we were too busy fighting amongst ourselves. So you had socialists arguing with communists, arguing with anarchists, and they didn't band together. And then that left them separated. And then when the Nazis rose, 
it was easy for them to attack these segregated, the segregated left, uh, and they just murdered the, sh the hell out of them. Um, so anyway, that infighting still happens today. All right. So in socialism, at its core, it's just a critique and of capital at a fundamental level to say we can't just reform it like democratic socialism suggests, at least the way we're defining it. Um, it needs to, it's fundamentally flawed. And so they'll say something like, um, it is predicated upon exploitation, the, they will say. Um, the profit motive alone. Um, there's all kinds of other critiques we won't get into. This isn't a socialism video. Um, but at its core, the main drive that we'll identify is that we want to um, bring democracy not only to politics, but also to the economy and which means our material well-being and often our stance in society. So at, at their core, they want to have a democratic ownership, usually by workers, not the state. We would call that state socialism or even state capitalism, like what will happen in China right now um, and Soviet Russia. Um, might be better called state socialism. Um, so it's, it's kind of like meet the new boss and the old boss in that situation. But there's a long, complicated discussion there that we, I, I'm not going to get into. So going back to this, uh, usually it's workers. So you have worker councils who own the factories rather than one person owning the factories. And then the people who work the factory get to decide what hours they work, how much they produce, what they charge. Um, and that's the core of socialism is somehow moving towards economic democracy as well as political democracy. Uh, and there's a distrust of markets, not an elimination of markets, but we shouldn't let market logic organize material well-being of everyone in society. So then we have uh, communism and it it's, goes quite a bit further than socialism, although a lot of communists will say that Socialism is part of that long road to communism. So if you if you know anything about Marx, he thought that the material dialectics, right? So different, this happens and then there's a reaction and then there's this, you know, so that, that process of action reaction uh, will end up accumulating, ending up in a communist society. And what he means by that isn't like any kind of state authoritarianism. Now, a lot of communist governments have done that but at least in Marx's version, um, the goal is to abolish like class distinctions. No rich, no poor. It doesn't mean everyone's exactly equal or everyone has the same amount of money. That's not at all what's going on. Um, and it's, it's just bad to do, long, to do that. I don't know, it's, it's terrible. Um, it just completely misses the point and is more of an ideological dig than I'd rather have good critiques of these systems, not soundbite ones, but okay, that's whatever. Uh, but back to communism, there's a lot to talk about there, but the end goal is to use the state to abolish class distinctions. And um, how did that go? In one of Marx's writings, he says something along the lines of, when will we be free? Um, when we own our own work, when we own our own labor, right? So uh, within communism, it's a very worker, and market oriented system. That's kind of what is concerned. That's one of the best critiques that it only focuses on on that. Um, okay, so let's get back to this. So yeah, they want to abolish this class distinctions. Um, what else do we need to mention there? Anyway, it's a thousand year goal to like wake up one day and decide what you're going to do. That's kind of like the utopic vision is, is that amount of freedom. Um, so for every single person in society, every single person. Um, so there's plenty of room to say, hey, this is how this society messed that up, or this is how this turned into something else or whatever. Um, but we ought to make sure that we're being specific on those critiques, just like we're doing with, with any of these. Okay, so let's, let's go further. Uh, then we have anarchism, and anarchism is another thing that's, I'm sorry, in popular discourse, it's crap the way they talk about it. Um, at the core, it's not just bomb throwing and punks doing, setting fires, doing protests, hating the man. Um, that certainly is there 
for reasons that they have, that we may agree or disagree with for reasons. Um, but really, the core of anarchism is, is not top-down control by anyone. And so they'll say, actually, all of these parties on the left will say, uh, what's kind of in, in, fun, in reality, in, in your life, what is the thing that has the most arbitrary control over you? Is it the government? I mean, hypothetically, yes, but in terms of your day-to-day -day lived life, it's not a government, it's usually a company. And it's usually the company you work for. And that's a hierarchy that determines your material well-being, whether or not you have health insurance, all kinds of things. Um, and you and I both know that wages are not necessarily tied to value of work. Um, Right, like think about all the essential worker stuff that we went through and are actually still going, right? That didn't go away. Um, you know, we'll call them heroes and stuff and notice that society will completely crumble and stop if people stop serving food, if people stop, you know, being nurses and doctors, if people stop doing those things that are sometimes really poorly paid. Um, society breaks down and so even though like we don't have a society without their labor, we don't pay them or give them the control over their own lives, economically, socially, politically, often, um, that scales with their importance to society, society running. Um, so they'll say, hey, not only governments shouldn't have hierarchical, hierarchical control over us, companies shouldn't, no one should. But that doesn't mean we don't self-organize, right? So there's mutual aid and consensus, right? Uh, at the core of anarchism is kind of the opposite of fascism. You know, fascism is about control of a very, like a very small top of a hierarchy, controlling and eradicating anything it doesn't like. Anarchism is the complete opposite. It's no state, no mutual, like, and the focus is on we help each other no matter who we are. Um, and we work, as long as it takes, we build consensus for what we want to be doing. Um, and so they're often, so there are all kinds of anarchist communities we can look at, but this isn't a video on that. But essentially they do, in a very complex, thick way, do organize, like it looks like a state from the outside, um, but it's bottom up rather than top down. So those are the major um, left, right political spectrum that we'll talk about in this class. And so try to use these terms in this way when you talk about them in class so that we have this shared understanding um, and so that we can actually make progress in what we talk about. Now, there might be space in the class for you to say, hey, I don't think conservatism really works the way you said it, Professor Emler, or at least it doesn't work in my pocket of the political realm. Or you might say, I don't know if this is really, I don't know, there's room to critique this stuff. If you notice, this is a 20 minute video on like 72 hours worth of discussion. So do try to use this. Um, hopefully it'll help kind of organize some of our discussion and let me know if you have questions over it. Okay, I will talk to you later. Goodbye.